Hello and welcome. My name is January Parco Sarnal, and I'm interim senior curator at the MCA Chicago. We're so delighted that you could join us today for our talk with Nick Cave, Demita Jo Freeman, Nona Hendricks, and Linda Johnson Rice. It is going to be epic, honestly. In a moment, I will bring on my colleague, Naomi Beckwith, who's the Manilow Senior Curator here at the MCA to introduce the conversation and our incredible panelists. Before I do that though, I just wanted to make sure that you know how to interact with us. So please see at the bottom of your Zoom window, the Q&A function. You can comment or send questions and we'll share those with our panelists. If you're watching on Facebook, we are checking that chat too. So go ahead and put your thoughts and questions into the chat that's just to the right of the video on Facebook. Today's conversation is supported as part of the Richard and Mary L. Gray lectures made possible through a generous gift to the Chicago Contemporary Campaign. So a special thank you to those folks who have been longtime supporters of us, as well as to those of you who helped support this conversation with your pay what you can contribution when you RSVP'd through our site. We are enormously grateful to be a part of this community in Chicago. We really appreciate your presence, all of you, whether you're joining us from Facebook or on Zoom with us, we appreciate your presence. And whether you're here in Chicago with us or farther away, we're glad that we could gather together. And now here is Naomi Beckwith, Manilow Senior Curator at the MCA. Thank you so much, January. And as and welcome everyone to this talk that January rightly said is going to be epic, epic. I am basically here not only as the Manilow Senior Curator today, but also as a fangirl because I cannot believe that I am going to be sharing this Zoom afternoon with these incredible ladies and of course the amazing artist Nick Cave. A little bit about the ladies that we are going to be speaking with today. Um, when I was a child, my mother severely limited my TV access, but there was an exception. Every Saturday, I could watch and dance along to Soul Train. And by dancing, I basically mean I copied the moves of Demita Jo Freeman. Demita Jo Freeman is a classically trained dancer and actress. Um, and in 1973, she became a featured dancer on Soul Train only after her second appearance on the show when Joe Tex invited her onto the stage uh, without her knowing. And she broke out into a now legendary, unchoreographed and impromptu performance to his song, I Gotcha. After Soul Train, uh, Freeman brought her moves, her style and that famous smile to American Bandstand. Uh, and she brought her gifts to many dance contests where she won the hearts of viewers. After Bandstand, Freeman worked as a choreographer for many of Dick Clark's projects too. And because of one song, just one, many people around the world know just one line of French. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? I'm sure y'all know it too. That line comes from the incredible glam, rock, funk, pop, soul trio, La Belle. Nona Hendrix was a founding member and songwriter for the group. This is the first black vocal group to ever make the cover of Rolling Stone magazine as well as the first black pop act to perform at the Metropolitan Opera House. A New Jersey native, Hendrix began her career as a member of, the, of girl groups such as the Dale Capris and later the Blue Bell singing classics and standards. But she moved on joining the genre defying La Belle. And after her stint with that group, Hendrix embarked on an amazing solo career where she continues to be a performing uh, icon, a songwriting icon, and of course, a style icon. I also remember as a child, the ritual of getting dressed for the annual Ebony Fashion Fair when it was in Chicago, when it came to Chicago on its national tour. Founded by the legendary Eunice Johnson, the fashion fair was of course a fashion show, but it was also a fundraiser 
And really it was a chance for a community to get together and basically try to outdo the looks that they saw on the runway. Linda Johnson Rice is the CEO of Johnson Publishing Company, LLC, which is formerly the parent company of Ebony and Jet Magazines and Fashion Fair Cosmetics. But for many years, uh, Linda Johnson Rice oversaw the Fashion Fair. And she did all that running a company as basically a national business leader and a national civic leader, but especially for us here at Chicago. She is a member of the board of directors of Grubhub and the Omnicom Group. She is also a trustee at the Art Institute of Chicago, a member of the board of directors of North Northwestern Memorial Corporation, and she's president of the Chicago Public Library Board of Directors. And in addition to her business acumen, she is the epitome of elegance and grace. Thank you all ladies for joining us. But equally, Oh, as with these ladies, I'm also here as a fangirl of the amazing award-winning artist, Nick Cave. And though Nick was born in Fulton, Missouri, we Chicagoans claim him as our own because he moved here after receiving his M MFA in fiber arts from the Cranbrook Academy of Art right outside Detroit. We know Nick Cave's work and performances because they've been featured in major exhibitions, both solo and um, group shows, biennials from around the globe, most recently at the Yokohama Triennial, and he has a major project currently on view at the new Momentary, uh, the Performance and Contemporary Arts Center at the Crystal Bridges Museum. It's also the case, happily, that Nick is participating in The Long Dream, the major exhibition up now at the MCA, and also online. And he has works housed in major permanent collections around the country, including the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Museum of Modern Art, um, and of course, our own collection here in Chicago at the MCA. And while he's doing all this incredible work around art and performance, Nick also is a Stephanie and Bill Sick Professor of Fashion, Body and Garment at the School of the Art Institute an incredibly accomplished, well-rounded, and really generous, creative person. I've had the real blessing of knowing Nick for many years and have shared the privilege of discussing many of his interests, his passions, his projects. And lately, Nick has confided that he's been thinking about the musical the Wiz. The Wiz being that star-strutted extravaganza of black talent from 1978 as a film. And in particular, Nick is focusing on the scene that we're getting a glimpse of now, a scene known as The Color Is. This is basically um, an incredible promenade, procession, and party choreographed by Lewis Johnson. And you see these figures here. What you can't hear is that they're dancing over an amazing samba beat with these horn interludes. It is dance, it is movement, it is fashion, it is joy, it is black excellent all together. And of course, it's a fashion show. And Nick has been really interested in pulling all these elements together in what is to be a future creative practice. So first of all, Welcome to all, especially welcome to Nick. And Nick, I would love to start off the conversation with you today and just basically ask, what really brought you to thinking about both the whiz right now and also what brought you to bring these incredible powerhouse women together in conversation today? Hello everyone, uh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be here with these amazing women that uh, have really influenced uh, my thinking, the way that I'm currently thinking. Uh, but what's been interesting in the last three years, I've been thinking about fashion. I've been thinking about somehow reimagining that as a response to my sort of exhibition. So going forward with, based around the solo exhibitions or major installations, I'm going to do a response, a capsule collection of sorts in response to that project. And so this particular moment right now is uh, <clears throat> here because I'm in, 
the midst of doing an, uh, uh, an amazing project with the MCA. And uh, this uh, performance, sequence, spectacle, fashion extravaganza is going to be in response to that sort of project. So it was important that I really sort of looked back as I was doing research and to think about these sort of critical moments that shaped my existence today was so important. When I think about uh, as a family and the role of dance and the role of music and the sort of role of soul training and the impact that they that that had on me and my brothers and my cousins and my aunts and uncles. And just that moment where we all sort of collectively came together and was really sort of very much committed to that moment, to see ourselves in that moment, to be sort of present and aware of the latest movements and dance and dress and style. You know, it was all part of this sort of liberating kind of expression that I didn't see uh, around me um, or in this sort of global context. And so that was important. And then the importance of Ebony, uh, you know, when it launched in 1945, Ebony Fashion Magazine, that was again, another pivotal moment in the black culture to be able to see yourselves on the cover and to be able to, to have these stories and uh, a viewpoint that we could connect with. But the most important thing about that was when I was going through it and I would come to the fashion editorial section and I saw these amazing black models on the runway in Paris, which again, we didn't see in Vogue, we didn't see in Cosmopolitan, but we saw it here. And then that just sort of led from, from that, the magazine into 1958 when Ebony Fashion Fair fashion show took off. And just what that did in terms of, again, this sort of moment in history where it brought families together. It allowed you to pull out your Sunday best dress to go to this event that was not a fashion show. It was a spectacle that was life-changing for me because I could, I was just imagining myself in that sort of setting and, and really, again, being liberated by this independence of, ex of expression that was everything. It just was magical. And then when I think about like the female groups, you know, I think about uh, the Supremes, I think about uh, the Marvelettes, I think about LaBelle, but LaBelle was different. They were funky, they were going against the dress code they were out of the box and fashion forward. And as a kid growing up, being radical, red hair, pink hair, blue hair, whatever, dressing crazy, mother like freaking out, like what is going on with this kid? But it was me trying to sort of connect to a particular sort of uh, space, a, a particular sort of identity and LaBelle, allowed me to see what that looked like. And so 
all of these amazing women gave me permission to be the authentic person that I am today. And through that these- so beautiful, I'm hearing. And through these sort of moments, you know, it's, it's my way of paying gratitude to uh, the impact that it has had on my life. Thank you for that. Um, there's a way in which I do believe people know you so much as a sculptor, uh, so much as an object and installation maker that people forget how deep choreography uh, and fashion have played those roles, those things have played in your life and your career. But I'm also hearing you say that uh, you found in the work of each of these women um, something that felt like a hybrid so that the fashion uh, fair show wasn't just about fashion, that Demita Joe wasn't just about dance, and Nona wasn't just about music. And so I'd love now to hear from the ladies a little bit more about the core of what they were doing, but also what it meant for them to cross genres, what it meant for their audiences to see something more than just uh, that uh, typical thing. And maybe we'll start with you, Linda, because I can see you first in my window. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, um, I am uh, absolutely thrilled to be invited to be on this panel. This is incredible. Um, and Nick, thank you for reaching out. I, I love you and love your work and the MCA and Naomi, everything that you're doing is just terrific. But you know, the, the really the beginning of the Ebony Fashion Fair, as Nick stated, it started in 1958. It really was started as a charity. And it was to raise money for African-American charities. And it originally was for um, Dillard University. And um, so that was the basic premise. And then from there, you know, my mother, um, who, you know, I think was the epitome of style and grace and sophistication and all those wonderful things wrapped up in a, you know, a steel magnolia from Selma, Alabama. Um, you know, she, she went to Europe um, with a, non-budget budget, which means, you know, John Johnson said, just do it. I know you can do this. And she really broke down a lot of barriers and a lot of very, very difficult places um, to try to buy clothes for the fashion show, for the Ebony Fashion Fair, to bring them back. And really what she wanted to do was to show our audience, a black audience, how beautiful you are and how much you deserve to wear Pierre Cardin. You deserve to wear Ungaro. You deserve to wear Dior. And so that I think was, was really the, the initial piece of it was to put together a charitable fashion show like nothing that had been done before. And, and it really showed, our, showed the audience, it showed us authentically what we could be and who we could be. And it just because you were brown skin and you could wear red, you can wear canary yellow, you can do whatever you want because this is all about how you feel and how this makes you feel. And we wanted to present, my mother always wanted to show that a black audience was as sophisticated as any audience could be. And you deserved it. You absolutely deserved it. And at the same time, this was also a business. <laughs> I mean, it was also you know, a charitable endeavor. Um, so it really ended up being a, a sort of a full package you know, road show, you had 11 models, you, they traveled by Greyhound bus. It was a, no, no, understand this. It was a different city every night. <laughs> um, Demita will get this, you know, it was on tour. And so when that show rolled in, it was a theatrical spectacle. It was a spectacle. Amazing. Nona, speaking of spectacles, um, <laughs> you know, we are all interested in your songwriting chops, your musical performance chops, but I am looking at uh, a vision right now. And it is so clear that fashion is a, um, a deep part of, of what you are as a performer. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you think was happening with LaBelle musically, but also what was happening in terms of the image you were putting in the world. Uh, well, thank you. I am, you know, thrilled to be here and to be here with Demita and with Linda and specifically with Nick. And uh, it's very hot in this, but I thought I'd wear it anyway to begin with. Uh, so LaBelle, really in terms of our, uh, what we grew into, 
coming from being a, a cookie cutter girl group, dressing alike in the same clothes, same shoes, same, almost same hair, slightly different. And uh, music being created for us uh, that we would then record and touring as Linda was uh, describing in uh, a station wagon and then a motor, uh, no, motor home station wagon and being on shows with lots of other artists, which is where we sort of cut our teeth and uh, it was our musical education to working with people who saw us more like the bands that came out of England uh, during the British invasion and working with Vicky Wickham and Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp, they said you know, they felt that artists should have their own voice, their music should come from them. Uh, they should put forth who they are. And they encouraged us to do that. And LaBelle was born out of that. Part of the, uh, the, I, the hybrid that you were talking about of music, art, dance, fashion, is really what LaBelle became. And it was more, some of it was our own expression of what we wanted to do individually. We wanted to have individual personas on stage, but come together as one, as a unit, but also to be able to share about what was going on in our lives and in, as women and in, as black women in culturally in the world and in our neighborhoods to our families. And so our music, uh, although we had this sort of like, you know, fantastical image and put on these mini operas basically, we were talking about, you know, what can I do for you? Are you lonely? Um, you know, songs that talked about uh, inner city uh, issues and problems, but dressed in silver and feathers and, you know, hopping around the stage like <laughs> some sort of strange birds. But we were trying to uh, not overload people, but share with our audience the moment that we were in. And that's what happened, that's what LaBelle, breaking that mold, breaking that fourth wall of the artists on stage and the audience sort of looking there, admiring them. We went into the audience, we brought the audience on stage, you know, and, and that was the difference. And they began to dress like us. So there was like almost seamless between us on stage and the audience. That's incredible. I mean, I've got some follow-up questions too about that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let Demita Joe come in for a moment. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you, um, Demita. You too were famous for your moves. You were an incredible live athletic dancer, but there was a look to what you were doing, and why was it again fashion so important to you and even to Soul Train? Well, to me. In the beginning, when I was on Soul Train, of course, all of a sudden, I did not think of fashion. But I thought of uh, poverty in a way, <laughs> because we didn't have any money. The places that I had to go to are like uh, Newberry's, uh, little, little, little shops, shops. But they got me clothes that was comfortable to dance in. So therefore, but yet I can also have my own I didn't have to look like a cookie cutter. I can always mix different outfits together. And so therefore that's uh, being on Soul Train and watching how everybody, all the kids, because that's what we were, we were kids. We were really functioning. So what you see is the comfortability of our clothes, our styles, uh, the way, and it create a movement. It created, I created, uh, I love dance, that's number one. I was fascinated when I, there wasn't a lot of black people in the ballerina world, but it was incredibly the way the legs are, the design of the body, the clothes that they wore, the tutus, you know, I felt like I was a princess, you know, in, in the outfits. And then to be on the, uh, uh, a street dancer in a way, that's what we were called at that time in 1971, of course, but you got a chance to create out of my style, uh, my tools of being a, ball a ballerina, I was able to bring that 
and flourish in a way of being original. You know, and you know, of course, every child, when they grow up, they want to be accepted. And that's what I want. I want to be it. So little things, you know, the twists, everybody was doing twists, but nobody was doing the movements, you know? So therefore I'm adding, but I'm, I'm not throwing away because I still respect what we had in the past to the day, what we had today. So therefore I'm always, even today, as old as I am, even the movements, I still add on different kind of styles of movements. And that uh, people were, I was uh, proud of a little bit of it, especially of Soul Train because it was a black show. It was the first black show that I was really on. It was the idea that people, when men, you are boys used to walk down the street and the white women used to grab their uh, on the side. Well, now we're teenagers and they're beginning to see a show where we're not all evil. <laughs> we're, we're not after you. We are very creative, t talented, young kids that has uh, aspirations. And of course, we use body, our body expressed what we felt. And so that's, that was my love for dance and being on the show and letting people like Nona, thank you very much. <laughs> she gave me freedom, Patti LaBelle, those, everybody, they gave freedom that we did not have to be a certain, uh, what you say, a cookie cutter. We could break the cookie cutters. And that's what I loved about dance. I love that you broke the mold, but you said it was a very practical decision. I just, I just needed to put something comfortable on to dance. <laughs> now there is some real flair here. And, and, and Demita Joe, you also spoke very eloquently too about borrowing liberally from your black life yes. and black culture. And I think that's another really important component that I'm hearing here too, that you all kind of broke the mold, but you thought very, very deeply about black culture and your black audiences. Nick, maybe I want to start with you because I know that you are thinking very deeply too about who's your audience uh, and what you want to do for them. Can you walk through to through us? Um, can you walk us through why it is so important to do things like processions, uh, performances, things that involve other people and audiences? And, and what is it that you want to do with them? You know, I think for me, it's, uh, you know, this sort of connection and bringing, folding people into my projects. It's always been part of my practice. I've always been, since I was 18, my first sort of parade was when I was in undergrad school where I made like 30 garments and we then processioned <laughs> down on the plaza in Kansas City. Why? I don't know. Why not? But for me, it's really sort of, uh, I am, you know, I have a platform and this platform allows me to work with these young people uh, and, to allow, and to basically give them this sort of foundation, let's say this residency and to see in that sort of process of building something the conclusion being this event, the spectacle. So for me, it's sort of using it as this sort of educational moment. It's also creating this sort of moment of what's possible. And that's the most amazing thing to know that anything is possible really changes how you choose to navigate and move about and design your life. And so, you know, I've always been interested in what I have been sort of gifted with and how do I sort of use it and yet uh, have a sense of plan, structure, idea, but also being able in that moment to build and to uh, create this sort of special moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that's, 
has always been part of my practice. It's, it's, you know, I'm interested in that sort of unknown territory, that space that allows me to question what I'm doing in the moment. Mm. But yet at the same time, having the confidence to know that stepping up to fear is the beginning of something new. That's amazing. Who do you think of as your primary audience? My audience is everyone. It's not a primary audience. I want, I'm interested in uh, this universal sort of audience that, you know, this work can be transported anywhere in the world, we all understand movement. We all understand dance in some capacity. We all have to dress. We all understand identity. And so to be able to bring this kind of work to an audience that really allows me to talk about liberation, to talk about independence, to, for me to talk about freedom of expression. You know, we all understand that. That is so true. This will give you that permission to, to do so. That's right, a space of freedom and liberation, as you said before. <laughs> Nona, who was the uh, primary audience for LaBelle, especially as you went through this amazing transformation? Well, people like Nick, <laughs> I would say, could be our <laughs> primary artist, audience. I mean, you know, uh, and as Nick said, you know, everyone, as it turned out, uh, that, you know, when we, we prior to becoming uh, LaBelle, we were, Pat, we were the Bluebells and Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells. And our primary audience had gone from, uh, you know, the audience that went to the Apollo Theater, the Royal Theater, the Regal Theater, the Black theaters around uh, the country, the do drop in clubs that we would played over time, tiny little clubs where you didn't know whether you were going to get paid or not, or shot or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And but then we would play college white colleges in the south. We would tour from Florida all the way up to uh, to Canada, and we would play all these sort of like Italian dinner clubs where we'd sing "Somewhere Over the Rainbow," "Oh Danny Boy," you know, all these standards. But then we we also played sock hops in the very beginning in high schools. So our audience was really wide ranging, and they all came under the the umbrella of LaBelle when we reemerged as LaBelle, all of these people who had grown up in a way with us came with us. They were a little, you know, not so sure in the beginning, like, what are you becoming? Uh, and then we also had another uh, group of people discover us, which is more sort of your post-rock uh, 70s um, audience finding us as well from the people who signed the Family Stone, uh, the, the rockers. And we had traveled to Europe uh, from the very beginning. So we had a European audience and that became uh, bigger because of being on the show Ready, Steady, Go and uh, Vicki Wickham produced that show. So we had a really wide audience um, that sort of congealed or, or coalesced under LaBelle because the time was right and people had more access and there were things like, uh, you know, more television access, more, and then the internet. Uh, so that's, I think our audience really at the core were people who, as Nick was said, was looking for this sense of freedom, you know, to be who they wanted to be. And LaBelle, you know, from what we were presenting, was like, okay, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to dress like I just came off of a spaceship. Uh, and that gives you, you know, the, the right to like dress however you would like to dress, whether, you know, not Pat would spray her hair silver. I would have, you know, you know, feathers coming out of wherever, uh, rhinestone face, um, all of these different things. So I, I think our audience was people who were breaking out of that the constraint of the 50s, uh, who'd been liberated somewhat in the 60s, the 70s had given more freedom and agency to specifically communities of color. Uh, it was post-civil rights movement and uh, 
you know, and so I think that's what it was people who were now sort of like this taste of freedom and what Nick was saying about being able to design your life. Right. People were beginning to design their lives. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And I love these kind of beautiful alien black women leading the way for everyone <laughs> becoming designers of their own life. Linda, the fashion fair ran for decades and I too am interested in the ways in which your audience may have changed or responded. Did you have to kind of maybe morph the show over the years or was the core the same over all that time? Well, you know, I think the the thread of the show was about um, was about performance, of course, was about spectacle, but it really was about fashion. And so the way the show morphed was the way fashion morphed. And so, you know, whatever was 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 hot or on trend, um, you know, during the collections, whether they were in Europe or whether they were um, in New York, you know, that's what we showed. So that really was sort of the morph of it. But, and interestingly enough, the audience for the Ebony Fashion Fair, obviously it was, you know, Ebony and Jet audience, of course, but also LBGTQ audience, a younger audience, young people, anybody who was, I think, inspired and who wanted to have a certain level of achievement in their life and they saw this as an aspiration that really was the was the audience and so i think over over time it morphed actually into a younger audience which was great that was great for us because they really started to understand and and love the fashion and the other the thing that I think was really key here was not only did you know my mother buy hot couture, of course, but what she really did is she launched a lot of very young black designers because that was really key for her. Was um, she had a degree in sewing and tailoring, and design young designers would send in their sketches. She would look at everybody's sketch and decide who she wanted to have come in to her office, bring in the garment. And she would take that garment and turn it inside out <laughs> and see, do your seams line up? How have you matched this? Because she wanted whoever came to her to do their very best and to be their very best. And so I think, you know, really having those young designers, those young black designers really was, was tremendous. And I think that gave them an opportunity and a springboard. The other thing is you have all these young black models that have never had the chance to walk a runway, never. I mean, Pat Cleveland, we, my mother discovered her when she was 16 years old. We had to take her mother on the road as a chaperone. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 so those opportunities that you're giving people is it, I think was, was really so significant and so, and so tremendous. And then the audience also, I think what they saw is they, people are realists. You realize you can't buy all those fashions, but there's nothing that says you can't go home and get your sewing machine out and sew it yourself. That's right. <laughs> and so that I think was incredibly inspirational. Hello, Nick, I know that's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Demita Joe did too. I mean, she just confessed to that as well. You know, we, we are we are a very innovative group here, okay? okay? And that's how we are as people. And so, you know, any amount of inspiration that the Ebony Fashion Fair could give, whether it was young designers, black models, um, just seeing the clothes. And then also remember, this was all for charity. So we raised $55 million for African-American charities. Right, so all right. It becomes, you know, one big package. I mean, I, I tell people, I look at Project Runway and America's Next Top Model. And I'm like, Lord, we did that 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you did, you did, yes. And, and inspired by Nona, inspired by Demita. I mean, all of these things come together. All of this comes together on the Ebony Fashion Fair. No question. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. No I question. I patterns out from uh, Ebony Fashion Fair and made my own clothes, made my costumes, made costumes for Pat and Sarah. Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, Ebony was the bomb you know, in my family. Interesting. At the beginning. Definitely. We had to watch that 24, uh, every book that came out, everybody. <laughs>
book. And honey, we were we were the models. Excuse me. I love it. <laughs> we the clothes, we were the clothes. But it was dignity that my mother loved that she, that, that whole the ebony, everything that was in the magazine, every fashion. I mean, my aunt was honey. I love it. Yeah, and this is yeah, real. I, I love this is true. And I think so <laughs> many families, especially black families mm -hmm. around the country, can talk about this idea, as Nick said at the beginning, that you wanted to see yourself reflected in excellence. And we needed those kind of mirrors as a community. And I just want to underscore the fact, in my opinion, that this isn't just about um, a way to think of oneself, uh, self-evaluate, or it's not just a way to boost your own ego. Right. This is also a very political thing. We're talking about the 50s, the 60s, and primarily the 70s now. And so I would just love to maybe get into that project of like, what does it actually mean to instill within folks, no matter how broad or narrow your audience may be, what does it mean to instill dignity? What does that mean socially? What does that mean politically? How important was that for you to be able to model something for people? Um, Demita, I'd love to start with you there. Okay, for me, when I was young in the 50s, I loved dance. In dance, I watched television 24 hours loved Shirley Temple, but I loved Bill Robinson more <laughs> because the creativity as a year, as black people to me just grew and it got bigger. I could never forget this, never. So it caused me to, to dance the way I wanted to because they did. It was something about the me freedom and in me I wanted to show other kids that we don't have to be always up high school you know you you see the shy ones on the side you know wishing I can be that popular girl or there wishing that guy but as we grew older is having more confidence because of history gave us confidence, the way we look, though, and also like Ebony, like Nona, like uh, uh, Nick, they showed their fashion, they showed their creativity, and creativity in me just grew. And that's what kept me abreast of being on Soul Train. I felt very honored, but I also was very uh, 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 honored when I get on Sir Shirley MacLaine, she wants to know about me. Cher wants to know about me. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Mick Jagger, get out of here. Those people wanted to talk to, uh, uh, to me and to know my creativity, to, to watch it grow. To, for, they wanted to also grab a part of it. So it was in, I was just, I mean, the, the, for me, the best uh, thing was when I got the chance to choreograph the Olympics in 19, the closing ceremony with, uh, uh, jo, uh, with Lionel Richie, 1984. I sat there and they actually wanted me to try to get people who were the breakers, the poppers, the lockers, modern dancers, put them all together. And I got a chance to create and choreograph that and little kids, now, most of the kids, believe it or not, they were from gangs. They were the, uh, the Crips, and they were the Bloods, and they didn't like each other. At the during this whole event, I said, we are one. We're going to show the world that we're all one. And everybody agreed. Everybody put down their weapons, and they used dance to influence, to grab each other. And we all held on. The best part was going in the, uh, I guess you would call the cave going out before. And usually, you know, you have a lot of mouth going, blah, 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 blah. everybody was quiet. For that one second, it was silence. Everybody grabbed on each other. Everybody prayed. 
and everybody, gr we, when we went out, I was so proud. I could not even stop smiling. I don't think I smiled. I smiled. My, when I got through, my, 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 my jaws were sore. But anyway. Demita, you're giving me the chills. I mean, you modeled <laughs> creativity. Anyway. You modeled unity. I love that. Nona, similar question for you. I just wanted to thank everybody on the panel. Thank you for. Oh, it's not me. you. It's not. Please. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the panel's not over. You're going to get to. I know that, but I just want to throw that out. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, thank you. You're welcome. But, no, no, I, I also am really interested in in what it meant for you to model these clothes, that vision, this sort of alien spectacle at that moment. There had to have been a message in that presentation. What was that for you and LaBelle? So, uh, thank you. I mean, the, you know, as a group, uh, three adult women uh, creating uh, performance music, uh, presenting ourselves, it was, we had gone through and lived through the civil rights movement and traveled in the South and not been allowed to go into use certain bathrooms, not allowed to stay in certain hotels. We lived the green book, uh, you know, and so that of course had an impression upon all of us and it, as it would but we also, as I said, we traveled to Europe and we didn't have that restriction of you couldn't go in this bathroom, you couldn't eat in this restaurant, you couldn't stay in that hotel, you know? So that understanding that there was this other, uh, this other, as Nick said, possibility, mm -hmm. there's possibilities in the world. But we, when we come home, we were back in this restricted, limited uh, sense of being. And that, of course, influenced my songwriting, which became the primary voice of Lavelle, mm -hmm. and that we could perform these, as I said, many operas expressing lots of different points of view about, as a woman, as a Black woman, uh, uh, Black people, uh, his, our history, doing songs like, for instance, uh, you know, Four Women, um, that's Nina Simone, and to you know, describing these four types of Black women, which also influenced uh, further my writing, Curtis Mayfield and his writing, uh, you know, uh, and just other people were, be were beginning to own the voices and take on uh, what they saw a lot of the English and European artists being able to do uh, in their music, like the Beatles. They weren't just singing about, you know, I love you, yeah, yeah. They had graduated, you know, to revolution, right? So, uh, you know, and I was friends with uh, Angela Davis and, you know, and we did things with the Black Panthers, uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, uh, you know, Bob Marley, you know, was uh, singing about very different, uh, you know, about social ills and, and political strife. And that had a huge influence on me and therefore the group LaBelle. So, you know, what Demita's is saying about people being able to, you know, when you're dancing, it's hard to shoot somebody and, you know, kill somebody when you're in the music and dancing and enjoying and, and feeling good about yourself, you know, you're, you're not hating on anybody else. And that was a very powerful thing that you did, Demita. That was really, you know, we need more of that in the world. We need you all to carry us to the revolution. <laughs> We're going to open it up to the Q&A uh, in just a moment. But maybe before we do that, a quick question for Nick. Nick, this is a hard thing, but um, maybe to encapsulate. But if there is one thing that you could say, or what was the most important thing you could say that you took away from these influences, what would that be? You no, know, I <clears throat> was thinking about that. And I was thinking that. Uh, that moment is this moment. And so I was thinking about just, you know, you how you need that one moment as the Kickstarter. And this moment has solidified this performance piece titled The Color Is. I needed this moment to verify what it is that I'm about to 
create. And so it's on 120%. Get I love it. The fuck ready. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to get dressed first. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about that. Don't do that. <laughs> In his color. Thank yes. you. Yes. The revolution may not be televised, but it will look stylish. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, Nick, we have a uh, question that seems primarily for you, but I love the ladies to chime in as they like. And uh, someone in the audience is seeing a lot of influence on and from queer ballroom culture in uh, The Wiz and what we've been discussing today. And so, Nick, I'd love to know from you how consciously you're referencing that, uh, where you see those connections, and, and also ladies, I would love to hear from you all about um, where you see a connection between your work and now, well, queer ballroom culture now, and especially starting around the 70s. Well, you know, I don't know if I just sort of, you know, yes, I'm a queer, black, fabulous man, <laughs> that is what I am. And so that's just part of how I express myself. But I don't see that it comes from any particular sort of place, as opposed to this is just part of my full being. And, uh, and to be in this sort of space right now within myself and to know that I can fully imagine, fully express uh, my thoughts, my ideas through this space of Black excellence as a queer man is everything. It is, though I also do very much see a show like Pose taking the category is yes. directly from The Wiz. Uh, or directly the Soul Frank. That's you know, exactly going down that line. I mean, so it's all sort of part of that whole idea of procession and, you know, showcasing and showing off mm -hmm. uh, oneself. But we've always been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 told, I told you the other day, I, I, and I've had several conversations with Nick about uh, LaBelle and that you know, we were going through our transition from the 60s into the 70s, and we were, we'd gone into some sort of dashiki, torn jean, jean type thing, you know, like uh, flower power, peace, love, that, you know, Afro thing. And these, uh, you know, Tony, uh, Richard, and, um, uh, oh God, the name just went from my head, Larry Legaspi and the group of guy, gay guys would come to all of our shows. And basically, as I said, they, they looked at us and they probably went, you know, they went to Vicky and said, can we make some, some outfits for them? <laughs> because I think we were looking at just a little like we weren't sure whether, like the platypus, <laughs> you know, like we weren't sure what we were going to be yet when we grew up. And uh, the and our whole silver table space futuristic look came from uh, Larry Legaspi's design and Richard's jewelry uh, design and Larry, um, you know, Tony and the other guys who helped, you know, fuel our, uh, our change, our metamorphosis into LaBelle. And that was definitely from the gay, um, you know, uh, community. And that was also, we've had such a huge gay following for so many years that a lot of um, our energy and the support for uh, the group came from that community. And therefore a lot of how we, you know, that energy is a very, um, very intense energy. It can be very like, you're not wearing that, are you really? <laughs> you you were gonna wear it? No, you, you're not, you're looking like that, no. This is, <laughs> that's, and it's important. It's important in the arts. It's important in entertainment because, you know, having a pulse of what's going on, that's where the pulse comes from. It has, mm -hmm. it has for, I don't know how long I am, as far as I can remember. That's right. Um, I want to make sure I get another amazing question in from an audience member who's asking all of you to reflect on uh, the current moment of Black representation now. 
uh, what we're seeing in the visual arts, what we're seeing in fashion and music. Do you see this generation of creators and activists as uh, transgressive, uh, commodified? What do you see as the hopes? What do you see as the vision of this generation? Well, I don't mind jumping in here because um, I, I see this generation of, of creatives as, as inspiring. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, that's the way I, those are, that's through my lens. Um, and, you know, a, a commodity, I guess, you know, that's the sort of the, the business term. Well, that is great if the business works for them. Mm -hmm. If it, if, if it helps to elevate them and what they are trying to achieve, then that's great. But a commodity for a commodity's sake for someone else's use is not, is not, doesn't work for me. That doesn't work for me. It's got to be for the person that's the creative. So I see so many young um, artists, uh, designers, um, um, actors that are so, music, oh my goodness, um, so inspiring. Um, and it, it, it keeps me engaged and, and it keeps me on my toes. Yeah. Um, and it keeps me informed and knowledgeable and educated. And so I see them as an inspiration, absolutely, 100%. And I say, go for it, keep pushing that envelope. Keep That's going, right. keep going, keep going. Great, because number one, whatever Linda was saying, that was the best to say it as, inspiration, because mm -hmm. I am in awe to see that keep growing. It doesn't stop, and it's not in one field, it's in many fields. I mean, it's down to the cartoon artist. It's down to in, even uh, uh, the garbage man. I'm, uh, he does it with, with charisma, with a smile. Come on, this is something he wanted to do. That's his creativity. And that's what I enjoy today of the, of the young people, their inspirations, their, their willingness, their, their strength and willingness to endeavor in things that says, no, you're not allowed to go through. They will go through it. And that, that's what I, I, I crave for that. I, I wish that was in me deeply <laughs> to just go forward. I don't care what the uh, guns are blazing or whatever, they will go in buck naked, <laughs> but they will just go through. That's yeah, right. I, I second the Danita and Linda on that, you know, the, mm -hmm. I am constantly, I, I, I engage with young people all the time at uh, Berkeley College of Music as an ambassador. So I'm around 19, 20, 20 something year olds who are mm -hmm. uh, just creative, creating, uh, living in New York. Uh, there are so many people come here from all over to, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. That is true. And, you know, they bring with them their own individual uh, ideas yes. and tastes. And then they see what's here and they turn it into something else. And, you know, and, and it's just great. I mean, on every level, I look at something like Lovecraft. I look at Watchmen. I yes. look at, um, you know, even going to something like M Empire was like, you know, for some people like, oh my God, what are they? <laughs> the art that they had on the walls and the music and the fashion and the, the whole sort of style. You know, the choreography. Yeah. And choreography. The choreography as well. <laughs> yes. And the, so people, and there are people who are live, are that. Mm -hmm. It's not like this is just a television show or, you know, Empire wasn't just TV. That, that comes from reality. Mm -hmm. You know, Donald Glover, this is America. You know, all these things are hitting like, you know, the truth of who we are, what we have to offer, you know, given the chance, the possibility of showing and doing. Yes. And when you open the door and keep the door open for others to come behind you, mm -hmm. with you, uh, these possibilities come become true. They become history as mm -hmm. opposed to possibilities. That's amazing. You all have set up spectacle. You have set up fantasy. But I love this idea that that wasn't a fiction. That was our reality that you were putting in the world. We are coming to the close of the uh, conversation today. And I have to say, I am, I am really all inspired. But I just wanted to leave the floor for Nick um, before we closed out. And basically, ask Nick if there's anything that you want to say 
to these ladies today? Uh, you know, I want to respond to the last question before I respond to the ladies. And, you know, I wrote down the level, the outcries, the levels of injust. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not, uh, will not conquer our ability to express. And so for me, that's really what right now is about, is that we still will continue to fight. We will still uh, use this space to express and to move ourselves forward. Uh, for the ladies, I mean, you know, do you know, look, it's like this. You know, I have these ideas in my head, these <laughs> green ideas of, you know, oh, I need to meet so-and-so. I need to sort of connect to so-and-so. And when I put it out into the universe, that shit happens. <laughs> That's right. That's what I was thinking. So here we are in this sort of moment that is life-changing for me in this way in which I dream. And so I can't thank you enough for uh, taking out the time and sharing with the world uh, and being as fabulous as I've always knew you were uh, and, to, and, and for our friendship. Love you, Nick. And we love you back. <laughs> you love know. you, love you, love you. <laughs> I can't believe I had a chance to not only witness this, but participate in it. I can't thank you all enough. Again, thank you, Nick, for the vision to bring us all together. Thank you, Demita. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Nona, for being the incredible icons that you are. And not just icons, but really active women in shaping the world that we're in today. I bless you. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting emotional. But, <laughs> but I can't help it. I, too, like Nick, am all inspired. I have to say one more thing. Sure. This is, this is a, sh a shameless promotion for Nick that I have to let Patty LaBelle know that we're coming to her house. She's going to fry some chicken and Nick and I. Girl, let's eat. <laughs> I love it. And we're going to have some patty pies. Yum. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. yum. Uh, can, you, can you FaceTime me, please? <laughs> me too. <laughs> Yes. You heard it here, folks. I also thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for my incredible set of colleagues. Thank you to my set of incredible set of colleagues at the MCA for pulling us all together on Zoom, on Facebook, January Parkles and Al for coordinating this talk and all of her team and um, on our public practice and performance team, our AV team that's keeping the MCA live and alive online. Thank you all. And, and again, I just wanted to say one thing be sure to wear everybody wear them please wear a mask everyone my life safe thank you <laughs> and shouldn't wear a mask thank you we wish you well bye everybody bye bye <laughs>